Welcome to the Application Processing General Session. Now, please welcome to the stage Director of Applicant Products and Customer Service Division for Federal Student Aid, Misty Parkinson, and Team Leader for Applicant Products for Federal Student Aid, Renee Lizier. Day job that someone's got to do. It's kind of hard when everyone looks up to you. Good morning, fellow superheroes. Although Renee and I are the only ones wearing our capes today, unless there are another one or two of you out there, I recognize your superhero status because of our shared superpower of helping students go to college. My FAFSA Superhero Squad back in DC is always busy working to improve the FAFSA experience and we plan to have a little fun today telling you about what we've been working on and why we have focused on the changes that we have been focusing on. Um, and primarily that's to improve the overall FAFSA completion experience so that kids who want to go to school can go to school. So Renee is going to kick off our presentation today. Okay, thanks Misty. So uh, this is a breakdown of what the next hour is gonna look like. We've broken it up into four different sections and I'm gonna cover the first half and then I'm gonna hand it back over to Misty. Um, so the first section is application processing statistics and then changes required by external sources and then enhancements as a result of feedback and continuous improvement. So we'll go ahead and get started. So for the application processing statistics portion of this, um, what we're focusing on is completion and subset of populations where relevant for the last couple of years so that we can look and see if what we're doing is right and also identify areas for potential enhancement in future releases. But before I get into the application processing statistics, I wanted to offer you a, fun, a few super fun FAFSA-ish FAFSA -ish facts. That's a mouthful. So did you know that koalas have fingerprints? In fact, they're very similar to human fingerprints. So in the event that in the mobile app we ever implement biometric authentication, you can have your pet koala help you fill out your application. <laughs> Next up, did you know that we sneeze faster than cheetahs run, four and a half times faster than Usain Bolt's record, and 20 times faster than Michael Phelps swims? We clock in at 100 miles an hour, which is just slightly slower than the first FAFSA received every year on October 1st. And lastly, did you know that when tornadoes develop over water, they create water spouts? And in doing so, they suck up large amounts of water and then anything in that water. So rest assured, there's never been a tornado strong enough to lift up a shark, but fishinado is entirely possible. And you might be wondering what this has to do with the FAFSA. And nothing really, we just thought it was interesting. Okay, so on to the statistics. So the first thing that we're looking at here are applications received um, in comparing the 2018-2019 cycle to 2019-20. So what you're seeing here is we had a slight, a slight decrease from 1819 to 1920 of about 500,000 applications, um, but rest assured, Comparing the 1920 numbers to 2021, we're seeing an increase. So whereas from 1819 we saw a drop, 1920 to 2021 seems to be picking up by about 300 applications just for the month of October. So next, what we're looking at here are applications submitted from high school seniors. And you see that we're comparing completed apps to submitted apps um, and just calling out the difference, a submitted app is an app that may not have signatures applied, so we don't actually consider an app completed until signatures have been applied to the application. So looking at 1920 to 21, what we want to highlight is we're seeing an increase of applications submitted and applications um, completed. And our overall goal is to see all submitted apps become completed apps because we want the most people possible eligible for Title IV aid to get in there and you know, get what we want them to have to help them with college. 
So next, we're looking at a table um, that's breaking down our applications by income ranges. Um, and so you can see we have it broken down by $10,000 increments. Um, and the left half of the table is focusing on 1920, and the right half of the table is focusing on 2021. And what you'll notice in looking at the two different years, there's no noticeable, no major noticeable changes between the income ranges in terms of percentage. Um, but you will notice that about 50% of our applications come from households with an AGI of less than $40,000. Additionally, you'll see about 25% of our applicants come from households with AGIs of less than 20, and another 25 are coming from households of 100,000 or greater, and then everybody else is following, or following in between there. Next, we're gonna look at the number of schools listed on the FAFSA form. So the pie chart on the left is focusing on freshmen, and then the pie chart on the right is focusing on all other filers, so basically returning students. Um, and what the pie chart on the left is telling us is that about 75% of freshmen are listing more than one college on their application, which means they're using the tools we're offering, they're comparing their options, and they're not limiting themselves to one school, um, and more than one institution is getting their information. And conversely, the pie chart on the right is showing that only about 39% of returning students are listing more than one college, which makes sense. They're a returning student. Most likely, they're attending the college they listed previously or potentially could be interested in another school. And so now we're looking at IRS DRT usage for the month of October, um, and we're comparing 1920 to 2021. And what this what this chart is showing us is that for the month of October for 2021, we've seen a 4% increase of IRS DRT usage. Um, and so this is based off about 2.4 million applications. So it's looking like um, about 62% use the IRS DRT. And this number is looking at overall FAFSA applications received. So of that 40, 38% that didn't use the tool, a subset of that population wasn't eligible to use the tool. Next up, we're looking at number of S&T applica applicants for the month of October. So you've heard a lot in previous sessions this week about the determination of S&T eligibility and how we've changed some logic based on the elimination of 1040 AEZ. Um, but what these numbers are showing us is that between 1920 and 2021, while we're receiving more applications to date for 2021, the numbers compared between the two years seem relatively consistent. So the number of students eligible for the S&T path um, has, has maintained. Next up, we're looking at applications submitted on FAFSA.gov versus the mobile app. Um, and so what this chart is showing us that we received about 2.4 million applications total. Um, and of those 2.4 million applications, um, about 98% of them came from the web but a mighty 38,464 of them came from the mobile app. You see the very tiny little blip on the screenshot there. Um, and so what, what we really wanna focus on here is that while this looks like a very small margin and compared to people using the web, um, we have to take, our time, or take ourselves back to a time where we were converting from paper to web, and that was a slow process, but it happened slowly over time. And what we're hearing from our users are, aside from FSA communications, um, they're finding out about the mobile app from our partners, from you, and you guys helping us communicate it and telling everybody how awesome it is. Um, and so one, we wanna thank you for that, and two, we wanna ask you to help us continue that push so that when we present this information next year, we could see that little blip potentially be a, a bigger blip on there and, and have some positive news to share with you. So this last piece of data I'm gonna share with you is a snapshot of a weekly report we get. And so this report is focusing on My Student Aid app downloads. And so this report is looking at things like the number of weekly downloads, overall downloads, and then it breaks it down by operating system. So as of November 10th, we've had 1,438,151 mobile app downloads. That's pretty awesome. And 63% of those downloads were to Apple devices. And so one thing we wanted to point out here is while last year's early numbers, early downloads, we recognize were probably a lot of FSA downloads, our partners downloading it, we're all checking it out before we, you know, we start sending people to it. 
Um, so when this year's numbers started coming in, we expected them to be consistent, maybe a little bit lower because we already had a million downloads and if you've already downloaded it, we won't get a second count. Um, but what you're seeing is at about mid-October, our mobile app downloads kind of picked up. So we're actually seeing an increase of downloads, which is probably a more realistic number of students and parents going out there and checking it out based on the good news that you guys are sharing with them. So next I'm going to move on to changes required by external sources. So I'm sure you're all aware that um, when we make changes to FAFSA and the mobile app and any FAFSA related products, those changes really derive from a lot of different sources. We take things like the data that I just reviewed, um, community input, advisory groups, user feedback. Um, but sometimes our stakeholders make changes and as a result we have to change to align with them. So that's what I'm going to review with you on the next few slides. But first, I wanted to read you a few superhero funny tweets. So first up, we have over here my very excited friend saying, I just found out that I was awarded the California Student Aid Grant Aid and my FAFSA was just processed. Can I get a hell yeah? <laughs> I like his enthusiasm, her enthusiasm. Um, next up in the middle, we have uh, Cestus chomping at the bit at 4.49 p.m. on September 30th asking if the new FAFSA is available yet. And then in the middle here we have a few sensible, very loyal Misty Parkinson followers. Um, Matt awarded Misty with uh, the best general session at the last year conference. Hopefully he votes for us this year as well. Um, and then down here we have Misty Parkinson for president. So is this where you want to tell us you're throwing your hat in the ring? Okay. And then um, down in the right-hand corner here, we have somebody that's a little less than pleased that we're reminding them they're single um, by asking their marital status. And in the social media world, we all know that equates to relationship status. And then a few specific, mobile-specific comments. I'm not going to read these word for word. I just kind of want to call out a few words that people use to describe their experience with the mobile app. So up in the left-hand corner here, uh, this person used to dread filling out the FAFSA, but using the mobile app was a breeze, and it changed her existence for that entire day, which is pretty major. Um, next up on the right here we have, it was self-explanatory, very easy, a click here, a boom, a bam, and before I knew it, it was done. It's almost like Robin wrote that one. Um, and then I'm gonna read this one in the right here, because I think it has a, a lot of good stuff in here. So the app is beautiful. It's smooth, easy to use, and easy to read. I had no problems whatsoever. I applied for my student aid laying in bed. That's awesome. Um, I was blown away, and I fully expected it to be clunky, as applications often are with government association. Um, but this is so, so, so above and beyond. Please give the people that worked on this a raise. They did a stellar job and the rest of our team. So positive reinforcement for the win today. So next, I'm gonna move on to a couple changes. Um, and some of this has been covered in previous sessions, so I'm just gonna kinda go over it high level and then hit the CPS-related uh, specific stuff. So for the Children of Fallen Heroes, um, as we heard in yesterday's federal update, schools are now able to use FAA access to report a student's eligibility. Um, for the scholarship, and as Jeff mentioned yesterday, we've only had about 50 applicants reported as eligible, but we anticipate that number growing as the, these children grow and become, you know, college eligible. So the images that you're looking at on the screen are from FAA Access. So on the left here, this is corrections showing where you can set the flag, but keeping in mind that you can also set the flag in application. And then the image on the right is student inquiry. So once the flag has been set, this is where you're going to see if the student's been flagged as eligible or ineligible. And so once this flag is set on the student's record, it's reported on the ISER, the ESAR, um, the SAR, and then the student also receives a comment code of 402, letting them know that they may be eligible for the scholarship. And if you'd like more information about the Children of Fallen Heroes, the COD um, common origination and disbursement system update, session number five, will have the information you're looking for. So there's a session later this afternoon, and then again one tomorrow, and we encourage you to check it out.
So next up, we have the DHS Save third step verification update. And so as you may be aware, we released 3.0 version of the user documentation that's now available on IFAP. So if any of you have been looking for it and not able to find it, our slide should be available shortly after today's presentation. Um, and you can access it by clicking on the link that's directly on the slide here. So I'm not going to read everything on the slide. I'm just going to give you a summary of what you can expect to find in the new version. Um, so updates from the last two electronic announcements have been combined and included in the document. Um, it provides direction on how to resolve the no cases found error message. Um, it includes changes to the additional, additional request buttons. The PD, PDPA user IDs are now enabled to view records and submit third step verification requests. DHS verification numbers will now start with 00 and end with the last two numbers in the year. And then it also provides direction on how to advise students who need to correct, renew, or replace their immigration documents. So after you've downloaded and had a chance to read the document, if you find yourself having questions or needing assistance, we've provided you with some guidance here on how to reach out and get additional information. So you can either email application processing division at ed.gov or leave a message at the number on the screen. And in your email and or phone call, we'd like you to leave the following information. The student's DHS verification number, your name, your phone number, and then um, the question that you have in as much detail as possible. And then we put a little note up here also, calling the SAVE Center um, may not necessarily get you the assistance you need because they're not really aware of your unique system access. So we encourage you to start with APD. So next up, I'm going to cover the tax form changes, which we've heard a lot about um, this week. So as you know, the IRS made some changes to their tax form with the 2018 year, which resulted in us revising and combining some questions, changing some logic, and then updating our edits based on fields. Um, so the images that you're looking at here are from the mobile app. Um, and what we're highlighting here is the elimination of the 1040A, 1040A easy. Um, and as you know, the elimination of that form resulted in some revised logic in our system, which I'll cover in the next slide. And then you'll also notice that we added the 1040NR, 1040NR easy to the foreign return type. So this was always a valid form type. It just wasn't specifically called out on our application. Um, so it's there now. And also keeping in mind, just like foreign filers, if you have a 1040NR, NR easy, you're not eligible to use the IRS DRT. Next up, we're showing you here um, the combination of the untaxed portions of IRA distributions and pensions. So we're just showing you the questions separated in 1920 and then combined in 2021, in addition to removing exemptions from the FAFSA form because it was no longer relevant based on the tax form changes. And so then kind of circling back to a topic that we've discussed um, in the last few updates, um, as you know, the removal of the 1040A, 1040EZ required us to develop um, a different solution for identifying S&T eligibility. And so um, in the spirit of the Higher Education Act and ensuring continuity of the best um, experience possible for our applicants, we identified the Schedule One question as the best proxy to kind of carry, carry forward um, that experience for our students. And as you saw um, in my previous slide where we looked at S&T eligible students, while we have more applications this year, the numbers between 1920 and 21, 2021 for S&T eligible students is relatively consistent. So it's appearing that the changes that we made for 2021 have really had a net effect. And so now I'm gonna turn it back over to Misty. Thanks, Renee. <clears throat> So I'm going to focus on enhancements to the FAFSA as a result of the different types of feedback that we receive. Before I do that, let's look at some specific feedback that we've received um, from students who are providing um, a, a not helpful response to some of our tooltips. 
You can see the first one here is related to the driver's license information help topic, and the response we received is, I've misplaced my license in the past couple of days and haven't had time to replace it. We've also received this feedback about the marital status question, because I haven't found the right man yet. <laughs> Regarding the student's high school name, city, and state, we received this feedback. I was homeschooled, so for some reason, my school is not listed. And finally, something only somebody in the financial aid field could appreciate. How many people in your parents' household will be college students in 2021? The answer is zero, but it won't let us put zero. Okay, now it's time to be serious. So we're gonna talk about FAFSA questions 35 and 82, and I wish I could say that this is the last time we'll talk about these questions, but in fact, we will talk about them one more time. Um, so questions 35 and 82 are the Schedule One questions. I challenged you at the conference last year to help us to make sure that this was a question that was worded in such a way that it would be understandable um, and helpful to people filling out the FAFSA. And I appreciate that you provided us with your feedback. Um, as I hope all of you know, um, we post a package of documents that include the FAFSA, the SAR, and some other documents uh, to regulations.gov each year and ask you to provide your feedback. And so as a result of that feedback, we were able to make some changes uh, to this question. You can see how the question language changed over time on this slide. The very first one is how we put it out in the initial package, and it simply asked, did or will you file a Schedule One with your 2018 tax return? So we received feedback from you. Uh, the prior slide gave um, an example of some feedback we received, and we combined that with information that we know about our users. For example, fewer than 50% of our applicants will encounter this question. Um, our users don't read. So the more text you put in front of them, the less likely they are to actually read it. Um, and we consulted with policy. Um, so based on all of that, we came up with a different version of the question, which you can see in the 30-day FAFSA draft. This was put back out to the public for your feedback. And where we landed is with the question label that you see at the bottom of the screen. It relies on um, people accessing the notes on page nine of the paper FAFSA form for the one or two people who complete a paper FAFSA. And for those people who complete the FAFSA electronically, we've included a direct link to a help topic in the question in order to provide that additional information about what the exceptions are. Another change that we made as a result of um, feedback and data is um, specific to FAFSA.gov. When we built the mobile app, we were able to uh, apply feedback that we had received over time in order to create what we believe is a better user experience in the mobile app. Um, as a result, we unintentionally created a not so great experience for people who start the FAFSA in the mobile app and then complete it in the, on the website or vice versa. And our data shows us that of the people who use the mobile app, 40% uh, of them switch between the two. So they either start in web and switch to mobile or start in mobile and switch to web. And that 40%, um, those people do not have a good experience. What was happening is if they started in one, saved their data, switched over to the other, they had to start back at the very beginning. The data saved, but they had to navigate through all of the questions they'd already answered in order to get to the point where they left off. And the reason for that is because we um, put some of the questions in different locations in the mobile app. An example is the student marital status question which was previously treated like a demographic question, but it's not really a demographic question, it's a dependency status question. So in the mobile app, we put it in section three, but on the website, it was in section one. And so we couldn't just take you where we wanted you to be because you hadn't answered all of the questions if you were switching from mobile to web. Um, so what you'll find now is if you start in one method and switch to another, it is much more seamless. Wherever you left off, you will pick up in the exact same spot. For those 
people who do not log in with their FSA ID, we've started masking the social security number on the login view on FAFSA.gov. So you can see on the left-hand side is what the login page looked like for 2019-20. And then starting with 2021, you can see that when the social security number is entered, we automatically mask it. But there is a checkbox below the field that allows you to display it so that you can see what's entered. Um, for the record, we also mask the social security number in the mobile app, but we implemented that change earlier than startup. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about a few updates that we have made to help text uh, based on the same user feedback that we chuckled uh, about a little bit on an earlier slide. Um, so three examples we have here, and I promise this is the last time we will talk about Schedule 1. Um, so, because the Schedule 1 question is new, we're monitoring it very closely to make sure that we're um, you know, learning about it, you know, whether it's worded properly, whether we're providing the right information to people. And so based on the feedback that we have gotten specific to our help text, we added this sentence in red to the existing help topic, which is basically telling people why they would file a Schedule 1, because that is the information that was missing for them. In addition, we have received feedback through our FAFSA survey that tells us that, in general, people are confused about how to answer the financial questions, which is not surprising. Um, and we received many suggestions that if we could show what the tax return looks like, that people would more easily be able to find the answer that we're asking them to pull from the tax return and put in the FAFSA. So, we think that's a wonderful idea, and I'm happy to report that we have implemented that change for just one help topic so far, and that is the Schedule 1 question. So this image is actually part of the Schedule 1 help topic. I believe we implemented that maybe two weeks ago, and we're now taking a look at all of our help topics related to um, financial questions, and we expect to be making similar updates to those. Um, but we will be monitoring the feedback that we receive um, to see if this was a change that uh, people have found to be um, helpful to them. Now that particular help topic is not one that we get a lot of feedback about. Are you a preparer and create a save key are like the topics that people just want to know more information about. They're two of the topics that people access most frequently. So the are you a preparer question um, is surprisingly popular. We actually added some language to the FAFSA question that says this is rare. And I guess people see that as a challenge, like, oh yeah? Let me show you. I'm sure this applies to me. And so they're accessing that help topic quite frequently. And the feedback that we have received indicates that you know, we needed to be very clear. If you are the student, you are not a preparer. If you are not paid to fill out the form, you are not a preparer. Um, and so we added the language that you see in the red box here. Again, we'll be monitoring this to see if um, it has had the intended effect. And now let's take a look at the change we made to the create a save key help topic. So for this one, people just didn't understand that the save key was different from the FSA ID. And so we very clearly spelled out for them that in fact, it is not. All right, so now let's talk about tracking um, the source of a FAFSA. Um, currently, when somebody uses the mobile app to complete their FAFSA, we're tracking it as a web application. And you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, that is um, how you're currently seeing it um, on your ICERs. That's how you would see it if you're viewing it in FAA access. But starting in March, we will be assigning a different uh, transaction source type. It will be an eight, and that indicates that it originated from the mobile app. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see that's what we will start displaying in FAA access, and this is what um, you'll be seeing on the ICER. And so that will allow you, and that's based on feedback from you, that will allow you to be able to track those applications that came from the mobile app. We told you when we rolled out the mobile app that we intended to add additional features to it, and we are slowly doing that. 
uh, one of the newest features that we added is the student aid report. Um, and although we implemented it at startup for 2020-21, we implemented it for both 2021 and for 1920. So here you can see some screenshots of what the SAR looks like. Um, I would encourage you, if you would like to see it in greater detail, maybe play with the links, see how the sections are broken out, um, you know, take a look at the uh, resource center. We have several people down there that are demoing the mobile app, and if you wanna see what the SAR looks like, you are uh, welcome to go down there and take a look. Um, the layout is different from what we have on the website, um, you know, and as we try to make further improvements to the SAR, uh, we would welcome your feedback. If you know what it looks like on the website, you know what it looks like in paper, you know what it looks like on the mobile app, tell us what you like, tell us what you don't, tell us what you hear from your students. Within the mobile app, we have done everything that we can to try to use plain language, friendly language, helpful language. Um, we're somewhat limited in terms of the questions themselves. Um, but the language around the questions, we have made um, a very large effort to try to make that language easier. And we did that uh, around March last year with our edits. Um, when we built the mobile app, you know, we did it with our, our guiding text pages and all of that other stuff. Um, we expanded that to our edit text uh, in March. And with the launch of the SAR, um, we did the same thing with the SAR text. So somebody who accesses their SAR on the mobile app will see much simpler SAR comment text. And you can see the difference. The left-hand side shows you what that text looks like on the website. And of course, that's very similar to what people see on the paper SAR. The text on the right-hand side is the same message, but a lot, you know, fewer words and um, more concise information. We're hoping to expand that um, that effort to simplify our language. We're hoping to expand that to the website in the near future. Obviously, and although this was feedback we heard loud and clear, it's also sort of a no-brainer, so this was something we just knew we had to do. When we launched the mobile app for 1920, it was just for 1920. And on October 1st, uh, we added uh, the new processing cycle. So for the first time, the mobile app uh, allows users to um, access their FAFSA, their SAR, for multiple cycles. So you can see on the left-hand side, this is what a user saw when they logged in. Um, to the mobile app prior to October 1st. They just had options related to the 1920 cycle, and now they have the two-tab um, approach where we um, give them information about the 2021 FAFSA, um, you know, whatever their status is, whatever their options are uh, that are relevant to that cycle, and if they want to, you know, view their SAR or if they haven't completed their FAFSA yet for 1920, it's as simple as clicking on the other tab, and then they'll be able to do what they need to do there. This is one of my favorite success stories. So when we launched the mobile app, we were you know, very excited about you know, how it looked. I think this was one of the things that we pointed out we thought was really cool, that people would be able to do the swipe signature, you know, because it's so modern and it's so cool and isn't that awesome. Um, and our students didn't like it. Um, as soon as we launched it, we started getting feedback right away. Uh, we got a lot of comments specifically related to the signature process and a lot of complaints. Um, and so we immediately took a look at what we could do in order to make improvements. Now, at the time, you know, when we first started receiving that feedback, we were receiving a customer satisfaction score related to the signature process of 81%, which is much lower than our overall customer satisfaction index for the mobile app. So we decided that we were going to not only um, address the specific feedback that we got related to the signature box, but just try in general to make the signature process much more simplified. Uh, for those of you who are not super familiar with the mobile app, you cannot get into the FAFSA unless you log in with your FSA ID. So we're talking about people who have already provided the authentication that constitutes the signature. So what we did, is we eliminated a whole page, and the entire signature process is now just on this one page. So they have the disclaimer statement, I'm sorry, not the disclaimer, the, uh, the terms and conditions, and then we float in their name down at the bottom, so they're certifying, you know, I agree to the terms and conditions. They, um, they mark that, and then they go ahead and submit, and bam, as some of our feedback says, you're done. 
So we implemented that change in April, and we immediately saw uh, a large decrease in the number of comments related to signatures. And our customer satisfaction index for signatures went from 81% to 92% immediately. And so that was a change that was very significant and very impactful. Um, and since then, we've been holding steady with the, um, the satisfaction score for signatures at around uh, 93%. So people are uh, consistently um, finding that the signature process is much easier than what it was originally. All right, so now I'm going to go back to feedback that we received during the public comment period. We have received feedback similar to this over the years, but one of the challenges we have with the public comment, um, the public comments that we receive is that people are happy to tell us what they don't like, but oftentimes they don't give us suggestions for how to make it better. And so it's, you know, sometimes, you know, we're able to come up with a solution and sometimes we just aren't. Um, so this feedback isn't necessarily new, um, but this year, along with the feedback, we received some suggestions for how to make it better. And so we were able to make some changes. So the questions are FAFSA questions 29 and 30, which combined are the ones that are related to um, you know, your college status, what you're doing in college. And we have you know, terminology in there that is graduate and professional. And we hear that you know, high school students who are about to graduate high school latch on to that graduate term and they think, ooh, that's me, and then they take themselves out of the running for Pell because they have basically indicated that they're not an undergraduate student. So we received feedback related to FAFSA question 29 specific to that, although it didn't offer um, a solution for it. I'm going to jump ahead here. FAFSA question 30, similar feedback, but we got a specific uh, recommendation for how to address it. And so what we did is for FAFSA question 29, you can see on the left-hand side, um, we have the continuing graduate or uh, continuing graduate professional or beyond. On the right-hand side, you can see that what we did is we added in parentheses examples of what that means. Okay, so your um, advanced degrees. And then for question 30, same thing. Um, and that's where we got the idea from. But we also added the word um, Sorry, college in the question itself. So you can see on the right-hand side what college degree. So we're hoping that those changes will help to address some of the challenges that you've been facing. And again, that's something that we would very much like to hear feedback on because we understand that um, either you or your applicants have had to make corrections to those questions in order to you know, resolve the issue. Um, our data will show us if we're seeing a decrease in the number of corrections, but you know, we want direct feedback from you as well. All right, here's another one of my favorite success stories. So we heard from you um, through FSA Tech, but also at the conference last year, that starting with the 2019-20 FAFSA, you were seeing an increase in the number of students and parents that were reporting combat pay when they shouldn't be reporting combat pay. And so here you see some, um, some um, feedback that we received through FSA Tech, but again, we heard it verbally from you as well. So we discussed a number of potential solutions, and we decided to go with something that really is, um, is fairly simple. We took a look at the question itself, and we made changes to the language of the question. So what you can see here is um, how the question was previously worded. And then what you can see here is that we took some language that already exists in the um, application, the, um, the handbook, the FSA handbook, uh, and we incorporated that language in the question to be really clear that most people would be reporting zero here. We also included a hyperlink to the help topic for combat pay, and this is the language of the help topic um, that comes up. What has happened um, for the month of October as a result of those changes is we've had a 70% reduction in the number of parents that are reporting combat pay. We made the same changes to the student questions and we're seeing similar results. So we believe that we have made um, a very significant change here. 
Another change that we've made is um, in partnership with the IRS. Uh, as you have all heard many times, uh, federal student aid is uh, moving in the direction of, you know, mobile. Um, we have the mobile app. We have the, the responsive uh, FAFSA website. Um, in both versions of the FAFSA, those people who were eligible to use the IRS data retrieval tool were having a horrible experience. They'd have to pinch. They'd have to zoom. They'd have to scroll up. They'd have to scroll down. They'd have to get the magnifying glass, and they would just have to try to make some sense of the page that came up so that they could authenticate with the IRS, get their data, and transfer it in. So effective on October 1st, and this is the IRS data retrieval tool itself, so it doesn't matter how you're getting to it, uh, it now is mobile responsive. So you can see here what that looks like. Um, they get the, the government system warning, and then the next three screens you can see are um, the authentication page itself. So you have to scroll down in order to answer all the questions. Uh, most of them pre-fill with data from the FAFSA, um, but can be modified. Um, you know, then they have to answer just a few other questions. They submit the request. They authenticate. They'll receive uh, this page here, which basically tells them, we found you. You're in our system. We're not going to tell you anything, though. But if you want to transfer your data into your FAFSA, have at it. They select the checkbox, and then they transfer their data. Now, we wanted to make this mobile responsive as quickly as we could. And so we worked with the IRS, and we focused more on it being mobile responsive and it being implemented quickly. We do recognize that it can be better. Um, so stay tuned for, uh, you know, changes that we'll be making to improve it more in the future. Um, and I just want to point out here that, um, you know, we do have tools available um, to help you to become more familiar with what our products look like. Um, there's the FAFSA.gov demo site, and then we have the PowerPoint presentations for both FAFSA.gov and the mobile app, and, you know, hopefully you're using those to familiarize yourself, um, you know, with the changes and everything. But the IRS data retrieval tool is not something that exists in, a, in, a, in the demonstration site. Uh, so unless you use it yourself with your own personal information, it's not something you can really easily see. Uh, so I wanted to point out that we do have screenshots, both the desktop version and the mobile version, in those PowerPoints that we posted on October 17th to IFAP. So if you want to see these better um, and also see the desktop version because what we're showing you here is what it looks like in a mobile device, you'll want to refer to that October 17th electronic announcement where we posted both of those PowerPoint presentations. Okay, and so now I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the things that we are working on now in order to continue improving the FAFSA. So first of all, Last year, we talked about changes the IRS was making to the 2018 tax forms that impacted the FAFSA. Guess what? They're doing it again. Um, the good news is that we already know what they are. Um, and if you're curious, you can go online, and they do have draft forms out there so you can see what the changes are. Um, they have reduced the number of numbered schedules, which is currently at six. So there's only going to be three schedules instead. Um, they're going to move some questions from, you know, the form to a schedule, some questions from the schedule to a form. Um, they're also doing something real super fun. You know how they combined IRA and pension questions? They're going to break them back out again. Um, they're also asking a really fun question on the Schedule 1 about cryptocurrency. And um, they're uh, creating a new type of 1040. It's the exact same 1040, except with bigger font for people over a certain age. Um, so we're looking at all of those changes and trying to determine what impacts they will have to the FAFSA. And as we make decisions about whether we need to make changes and what changes those will be, we'll be communicating that through our, um, our normal channels. Um, we also are on track. I believe uh, Craig mentioned this in the verification session this morning. Way to steal my thunder, Craig, but whatever. Um, the Schedule 1 question, we do expect to be receiving the answer to that question from the IRS um, when 
sorry, we won't receive it, when a user is um, using the IRS data retrieval tool to transfer their data into the FAFSA, they will also be transferring the answer to this question. So um, those people who don't use the IRS data retrieval tool and are presented with this question will still be required to answer it manually, but those people who use the data retrieval tool will not. It will be automatically populated. We continue to do uh, formal usability studies, and I wanted to just cover a few of the topics that we plan to be doing some usability on. One is related to the IRS data retrieval tool, which I mentioned earlier, um, because we focused on just sort of getting it out there. But now that we have it, we want to be able to get some feedback from our users and see how we can make improvements to it. So we're working on um, planning for a usability study for that now. We're also targeting specific areas of the website, the mobile app, or a combination of both to see where we can make improvements. Uh, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, when we created the mobile app, we were able to apply some feedback that we had or some, you know, some lessons that we had learned in order to uh, you know, try to make that a better experience. What we want to know is, did we succeed, and do we want to apply some of those things to the website, um, or is there still area for improvement? And if so, you know, let's make those improvements to both. So some specific areas that we're looking at doing some uh, usability testing on are um, the federal school code search, the high school search. We know that that's something that we really need to uh, make improvements on. Um, the process of editing data prior to submission um, currently, a user, and this happens in both the mobile app and the website, when they get to the end of the form, we give them a summary of all of the answers that they've provided, and there are hyperlinks to all of the questions. So if they see that they've answered a question incorrectly, they can easily go back to that question and they can make a change. I say easily because I know how it works, but if people you know, recognize it's a hyperlink, they can go back, they can answer the question. But what do you do from there? It's not so easy for people to understand. And so we want to try to create a better, more intuitive process because you know, sometimes people make mistakes. Or when they see all the data together, they realize, well, yeah, I think I probably got that wrong. And it's not that easy for them to go back and make uh, changes before they submit. So that's something uh, that we want to take a look at. We're also looking at the concept of the FAFSA parent, which we introduced in the mobile app, and we want to get some feedback on that and see if that's something that we want to apply to the website in a similar way or if there's you know, a different way that we want to tackle that. Um, also, the household size. Uh, we made some changes with the 1920 launch. You'll see them in both the mobile app and the website, where instead of just asking the household size question and giving people the option of using a worksheet, we forced them into the worksheet. Um, and we want to take a look at that. You know, has it been effective? Are we getting the right results? Is it still confusing for people? Um, we're also looking at the number in college question. That's another one that people struggle with. You saw the, the comment um, on the earlier slide. Uh, you know, it, are there conditions where we can assume a number? Um, and if so, do we want to do that, or does that make it more confusing? Uh, do we want to create a worksheet like we have for the household size? Do we want to leave it alone? Do we want to do something completely different? Um, and then just generally, we want to look at the login process on the website. So for the mobile app, you're required to log in with your FSA ID, and we allow you to tell us your role. Are you there as a student? Are you there as a parent? Are you there as a preparer? We don't have any of that on the website, and so we want to look at what we want to do on the website. I will say that a true roles-based solution solution is something that is not a short-term solution, something we have to work towards, but we want to be working towards it instead of just waiting until we can do a whole big bang thing. So we're going to be doing some usability uh, testing on that and focus groups in order to learn more. All right. So, you know, I want to point out that although Renee and I are privileged to be up here telling you about the updates we make, we don't do this work by ourselves. There are a lot of people that we work collaboratively with within federal student aid as well as external to federal student aid. Um, you know, so I want to recognize, you know, everybody, uh, and that's a, that's a gigantic group of everybody's. Um, but I do want to introduce you to our team. Um, in addition to me and Renee, uh, we have Zelma and Cameron and Jonathan and Kim and Manal and Becca. Manal and Becca are actually here at the conference this week, so if you want to stop in and say hello, they are in the Resource Center demoing the mobile app. So if you haven't had a chance to see the mobile app, please stop by and say hello. Um, so this is what we all look like in our superhero costumes, which is how we walk around the office, you know, pretty much all the time. But this is what we look like when we're not in our superhero costumes, but we still look totally superhero-y, yes? <laughs> so, 
So on behalf of our team, I just want to thank you all for partnering with us and for, um, you know, for using your, your superpowers wisely. I think we work very well together, and I think we are accomplishing amazing, amazing things. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the conference.